So you're looking for a way to do your audits quicker and yet get really good evidential manner. I'm going to show you how to do that using substantive analytics. Substantive analytics is the use of plausible relationships in numbers that you see in financial statements. For example, you might expect payroll to be, say, 30% of total expenses because you've seen that ratio in the past. So based on that plausible relationship, the percent of payroll to total expenses, then you can search for and create evidential manner by using uh, percentages and also by using comparisons to the prior year. If you were auditing an entity that only had three people in it, then that's pretty simple. We look at total salaries divided by total expenses. That gives us a ratio. We compare it to the prior year, and we're done. But if we're looking at an entity with two or 300 people, well, now we need to disaggregate that payroll information and we might use payroll expenses by department, for example. So if there's 15 departments, then I'm going to take the total payroll by department, then divide total payroll by department by total payroll expenses. And then I'm going to compare those ratios for each department with the prior year. And if I want to add even more strength to this substantive analytic, I might compare it to the last, say, three years. So by using substantive analytics, I can develop evidential manner that proves the occurrence and accuracy assertions in relation to the payroll expenses. And I can do this fairly quickly. Some auditors use a test of details like reconciling 941s back to payroll. I've done that. That can take a half a day to a day in some organizations. So a much quicker way to develop your evidential manner for payroll would be through the use of substantive analytics as we just discussed. So, are there some other areas that are appropriate for substantive analytics? And I want to say, yes, there definitely is. And some of the low-hanging fruit would be accounts such as depreciation expense. If your client is renting, say, apartments, and they've got 50 apartments that are rented at $2,000 a month, and they're all identical, well, shoot, let's just compute the expected revenue based on those numbers and then compare it to what was recorded. And that is a really quick way to prove that revenue account. Now, there are some balance sheet accounts whereby you might use substantive analytics, such as prepaid assets. I think about prepaid insurance. Those balances usually year to year don't change a great deal. So I can compare this year's balance with, say, the last two or three years and get the evidential manner that I need for that account. Now, one thing you want to look for in substantive analytics or where to use those is in lower risk areas. So prepaid insurance is fairly low risk, about as low risk as it gets. So it's appropriate for me to use substantive analytics in relation to that account. Accounts that are high risk, especially those that have significant risk, uh, you should not use substantive analytics for those. The high-risk accounts require a test of details. So if you're looking at a high-risk area, something that's highly complex or something that is subject to potential theft, then you can use substantive analytics, but you'll also need to perform a test of details 
in combination with the substantive analytics. Now, it may be better in this instance with a significant risk to just perform the test of details, but you can combine the test of details with substantive analytics. All I'm saying here is you can't use substantive analytics alone for significant risk areas. There are also other asset accounts whereby uh, substantive analytics works, such as property, plant, and equipment. So if you've had only a few additions to PP&E during the year, then it would be appropriate to use a comparison of this year's plant, property, and equipment with, say, the last couple of years. Now, if there's been a lot of activity in PP&E where they're buying a lot of new assets, a lot of new equipment, maybe they're building a new building, then the substantive analytic route becomes less relevant and you want to move more to the test of details. Another account I think of on the balance sheet that could be subject to a substantive analytic would be debt, provided there's not a lot of new debt or they haven't paid off a lot of their old debt. So what you're looking for in substantive analytics you're, you're looking for accounts that, that are relatively stable and that are predictable. So if you can use substantive analytics in those areas, such as payroll, such, well, payroll expenses, such as depreciation expenses, such as rental income, such as prepaid insurance, then you're going to be safer. But again, as you move toward the more high-risk account balances and transaction balances, you want to move more toward the test of details. Now, there are ways to increase the level of assurance that you receive through substantive analytics. And one of those ways is adding additional comparative years so if your initial substantive analytic was just comparing this year with the prior year, you may want to add, say, three or four or five years as you do so. You increase the level of assurance that you receive from that substantive analytic. Another thing you want to do is as you look at the comparisons, if they don't fall within your expectation, then you want to inquire of the client why that number did not fall within the range. And you may need to perform a test of details in addition to the substantive analytic to get more evidential matter. Now, many times you can inquire of the client get a good answer, you want to you want to audit that answer so make sure that what you've been told is really true. But if you do that, a lot of times you can use the comparisons and not move into a test of details. So there's some other things you can do to increase the, the level of assurance. And one of those is to disaggregate the information. So if you're looking at, say, total revenues and you're comparing that with prior periods, we'll break revenues into, say, product categories or geographic regions. And by disaggregating that information, you'll increase the level of assurance that you're obtaining through that substantive analytic. So let's talk about documentation in relation to the substantive analytical work paper. I'm going to give you six things that you need to document. I'll but try to be quick with this. Number one, you want to document the reliability of the information that you're using. So if you're getting junk from a general ledger, then substantive analytics don't really work. So you want to document on that work paper why you believe the information, say, from the general ledger is reliable. 
And that could be as simply as, you know, I've audited this client for five years and I've found their accounting system to be reliable and useful. We haven't had any significant journal entries in the prior year. Something along those lines. You might also just, based on your walkthroughs, as you look at the internal controls, you'll get a feel for whether or not those controls are appropriate, whether or not they've been designed appropriately. If they are, then you have a little bit more confidence in the reliability of the information. And so on the substantive analytical work paper, you want a sentence or two about reliability. That's number one. Number two, document the assess risk of material misstatement by assertion. So if I'm looking at payroll, for example, then I, you know, I'm going to document my inherent risk and my control risk and my risk of material misstatement in relation to the occurrence assertion. And if that risk is, say, moderate, then I'm going to show that on the work paper. The third element I'm going to document for my substantive analytical work paper is the expectation. So you want to document your expectation before you start looking at the numbers, say, from the general ledger. The reason you document the expectation first is you're trying to remove any bias. So if you've already looked at the numbers and you already know what they are before you create the expectation, then there's a tendency to go, okay, that's what it is, that must be right. But the proper way to do this is document the expectation first, then compare your expectation with the numbers recorded in the general ledger and see if, if they look acceptable. Document that expectation. That expectation can be a range. So, for example, you might say, I expect payroll expenses to be between 1 million and 1.1 million. And if the performance materiality is, say, uh, a half million, then you may want to document the performance materi materiality as well. But your expectation would be, in this example, 1 million to 1.1 million. Now, the fourth thing you want to document is your approach. Document whether you're using a substantive analytic by itself and nothing else, or if you're using that approach along with the tested details. You can combine the substantive analytic with the tested details. If you do, document that on the substantive analytical work paper. Now, the fifth thing is document your acceptable difference. So we said with payroll, we expected the range to be from 1 million, 1 million to 1.1 million. Well, what if payroll is $950,000, so it just barely falls out of that range, but it's only $50,000 different? Well, that's probably an acceptable difference. And by acceptable difference, I mean you inquire the client, why is this a little bit out of the range? They tell you, and you're satisfied with that answer, there's nothing else that needs to be done. That's an acceptable difference. So in this example, we might say our acceptable difference is $50,000 north or south of that $1 million to $1.1 million range. If it's $50,000 more, $50,000 less, I don't really care. It's an acceptable difference. I'm not going to do much. Uh, beyond that initial substantive analytic because that, dif that difference between what was recorded and what I expected is within my acceptable difference amount. Now the last thing I'm going to ask you to document is the conclusion. 
one of my favorite things. So I think in almost every significant work paper, we should have a conclusion statement. In this uh, substantive analytical work paper, I would simply say whether or not the account balance or transaction balance is materially correct. The purpose of the analytic is to create evidential manner to support the number that we're looking at. So our conclusion should be that the account balance or the transaction balance is materially correct. So there's some ideas about using substantive analytics. In summary, think about using substantive analytics to create evidential manner in your audits for those areas where it's predictable, such as payroll or depreciation expense. Those areas you can wrap your arms around fairly quickly by doing some comparisons with the current year and the prior year, or maybe some ratios. Make sure you document those six elements that we discuss, and you'll be in a much better place. In summary, those are one, the reliability of the data, two, the assessed risk of material misstatement by assertion, three, the expectation uh, for that analytic, four, your approach, you know, whether or not you're doing just a substantive analytic or you're combining that with the tested details, five, what's the acceptable difference Six, what's your conclusion in regard to the work that you've done? It should be that this substantive analytic provides evidential manner to support this account balance or transaction balance. And I don't believe that there's any material misstatement in this account. So that's how you use substantive analytics to create evidential manner to support your audit opinion in a very short period of time. Try it. I think you'll like it.